The stories that we tell about the past matter. They help to contextualise where we are today. They are also often what we base our understandings of what's possible for us as humanity. And with the period that I study prehistory, that's even more important because we tend to treat that as a natural baseline for humanity, who we are when we peel away all the levels and all the different developments from science and te technology. Now, I see my responsibility as an archaeologist who studies prehistory to examine what those stories are and what those narratives tell us about who we are. I specialise in the Neolithic period, so that's the period when we first started farming, when we first domesticated plants and animals. And my research focuses on the Neolithic societies and the social lives of people as we began to settle down and farm. Um, and most recently, I've become interested in thinking about how we've begun to tie the origins of farming with the beginnings of persistence inequality. So the point at which it became inevitable that we would be unequal as a society. And my current project um, with collaborators from France and from different parts of the UK, counterculture, is, is analysing those kinds of questions. So the link between inequality and farming, we can trace that back really to 18th and 19th century thinkers such as Marx. Um, and these thinkers made a strong connection between farming um, as, as the point of origin for persistent inequality because it was about the first time land mattered, access to land. Marx hypothesised even more that while hunter-gatherers might be more cooperative or, or have more collaborative endeavours, farming would be the point at which inheritance started to matter, the passing on, on, on of land from one generation to the next. Um, now, at Marx's time, archaeology was just in its infancy, and we were only uh, just beginning to sort of develop the discipline itself at the time. But his ideas have remained incredibly persistent and incredibly persuasive up to today. But can we really see this in the archaeological record? So before I go on, I just wanted to give you a quick context to the, the region that I'm going to be talking about today, um, and that's the spread of farming in Europe. So agriculture developed in several different parts of the world independently, but in Europe it developed here, in the Near East, about 12,000 to 10,000 years ago, so about 10,000 to 8,000 BC. My research focuses on the secondary development of the Neolithic. That's the spread of domesticated animals and plants into the areas north of the Alps. So here, stretching from France all the way through to modern-day Ukraine. And that period of time developed about 7,500 years ago, or 5,500 BC. So when I tell people that I study inequality in the, Neolithic people, in the Neolithic period, people are often very curious to know how it's possible to answer such complex questions from archaeological evidence. They say, but isn't it just broken bits of pottery? Where do you get your, your evidence from? What prehistorians, what archaeologists do, is we try to layer together as many different types of evidence as possible. We try to compare and contra contrast the different streams that we have to bring them together to try and investigate different questions. So we actually have a very rich material record for the Neolithic. So I've cheated a bit here. This is a reconstructed example of a Neolithic longhouse from an open-air museum called Mammuts in Austria. Um, and we don't actually know what the upstanding parts of the buildings would have been like, but we do have the post holes, and from that we can tell an awful lot of information. What's relevant for us here, though, is we can also talk about the variation in households. So, on average, these buildings would have been about 20 metres long. So, they would have dwarfed anything that would have stood in Central Europe before. But, we see variation in their size from about 8 or 9 metres all the way up to 60 metres long. So, much bigger than some of the houses which people live in today. Burials, too, give us a fantastic wealth of information. Um, then also suggest that we are seeing a society in which inequality is beginning to develop. So people were buried with a whole range of different types of objects, from no objects at all to incredibly rich assemblages of what we call grave goods. 
So, for example, some people were buried with what we call polished stone tools, so adzes and axes that probably would have been used for woodworking that would have taken hours of work to polish up to this high sheen. We also find jewellery made from seashells that would have travelled hundreds of kilometres from the Adriatic coast into Central Europe in order to be buried with people. But are these interpretations so clear-cut? Do the variations we see in houses mean different uh, wealth uh, disparities for the population? Or are we see merely seeing homes for different types of activities? Your starter home versus the forever home once children come along. And in terms of the burials, are we really seeing objects that belong to the individuals in the graves? Or are they gifts from mourners? Are they people standing around the gravesite and, and giving gifts in memory of that person? So these different interpretations have long been um, debated in archaeology. And over the last decade or so, we're really lucky to have developed methods which now allow us to add even more information to begin to tease out some of these different interpretations that we've had. The chemical signatures in bones and teeth are allowing us to assess the kind of life ways that people were living, where they ate, what kind of uh, mobility patterns they had, how much they were moving around. And we're even now able to examine the kind of food particles trapped in dental plaque um, to examine the kind of diets people had, but also the kind of craft activities and environments that they lived in. What we can do is to begin to compare and contrast all of these different types of evidence together. And what this data gives us is the chance to tell the history for those people who were buried without grave goods, for whom we haven't been able to investigate in as much depth as before. So what I'd like to do now is just to tell you a little bit more about some of these methods. So they work a lot like radiocarbon dating. We analyse the ty different types of isotopes that are present in the skeleton. And this is because you are what you eat, very literally. The things that you eat go into building up your skeleton as it grows and remodels across the course of your lifetime. So, for example, some bones remodel over the course of 10 or 15 years. So you're never really very much older than about 15 or 20 years. We analyse three different isotopes. Carbon and nitrogen isotopes tell us about diet. Nitrogen comes from the meat protein in your diet and varies with the amount of meat or fish that you're eating or the amount of um, uh, protein that you're consuming, so where you are in the uh, food chain. Carbon tells us more about plant protein and where you're sourcing your food, so whether you're getting your food from, a, a, a la from the land or from water or whether it's from an open or more forested environment. Strontium is a bit different. This comes from the local geology, and it's, the ratio stays the same as it makes its way from the rocks that have weathered into water, on into plants and animals, and then eventually into the human skeleton. For strontium, we analyse teeth, because these grow and mineralise in childhood. So that value is then set from once the tooth has erupted, and we can then compare the value from that individual to the local geology and see whether they've moved during their life or not. In counterculture, we're also developing a really brand new technique called dental calculus analysis. So this is dental plaque. Um, and this is my postdoc, Elena Foran, who's been uh, carrying out this research. What we do is we scrape away the remains of the dental plaque left on the teeth, clean it up, and then subject it to a very high-powered high microscope. Um, and this allows us to see what kinds of things have been caught in preserved in the dental plaque. And that can be anything that's been in the mouth or inhaled. So, for example, early medieval populations, we found an awful lot of um, charcoal because they live in very, very smoky environments. And so together, these types of techniques, with the existing evidence that we have, for example, from graves, tells us, allows us to test whether the things we see in death are what we see in life. Does status in death match status in life? It also allows us to talk about the outcomes of inequality. Are those people buried with the richest uh, grave goods having the best outcomes? Are they having the best diets? Are they the healthiest people? So now I'm going to go on and talk about the results. I'm going to start with the strontium um, isotope data. The so strontium tells us all about mobility. We found two patterns here. The first one is that women moved more than men. So this graph shows you the value 
of the strontium, so whereabouts in the landscape people came from. This is the average for the farmland in Central Europe, but it varies a little bit. So we've adjusted this to the mean, and you can see that many of the women, as the circles, are away from the rest of the population. They were the ones that did most of the moving, and we've interpreted this as patrilocality. The second pattern we found was associated with males buried with polished stone adzes, so buried with these stone tools here. We found that they very, very rarely moved. In fact, nearly none of them had moved. They, the conditions in which they were born into were leading to them being buried 30, 40, 50 years later with this particular object. And we interpret that as perhaps being the first hints that we have of some kind of inheritance taking place, the first time we begin to see it in the archaeological record. However, we see something entirely different if we look at the carbon and nitrogen results, those that represent the diet. So here we have the, the nitrogen results that tell us about the type of protein, but also how much there is in the diet, and then the carbon, which tells us whereabouts people are eating in the landscape. And the results are very, very tightly clustered. We can see this more clearly when we compare the range, the average range that we see for a Neolithic diet to what we see for something like the Roman period. So men, women and children in the Neolithic are all eating the same food, they're all getting access to the same type of foodstuffs. And so hot off the microscope, if you like, this is some of the results from, from Eleanor's work with the dental plaque. Um, what she's found is that for some of the women, we found bast fibres. Now, bast, trapped up in the dental calculus, comes from woody plants like hemp and nettle. And we don't think that they're coming from someone drinking um, some nettle tea. We think they're coming from textile production. Because in these individuals, we also see very unusual teeth wear patterns. So this isn't tooth decay. This is where someone has been using their mouth as a tool, holding onto the, the fabric as they're beginning to create spun fibres. And when we went and looked at the lives of these women, we don't see them having a particular range of grave goods or having a particular diet. This is everybody from across the whole of the population who was engaged in this activity. So I began by discussing some of the ways, some of the, the early ideas that we've had about how inequality uh, was tied to the start of farming and how that had still influenced us today particularly how we tied the beginnings of farming to the origins of persistent inequality, that point at which in time it became inevitable that we were, we were, in, we were unequal as a society. However, the results from counterculture are suggesting a bit more complex narrative. Rather than the kinds of land ownership or access to particular type of resources predicted by Marx, we're seeing that this didn't carry through in terms of the access to food and to the types of foodstuffs that people were eating. Perhaps we can even propose for the Neolithic that there was an obligation to share the food that you had. You weren't holding on to your resources, you were sharing it. Perhaps through feasting through feasting activity. So those broken bits of pottery that we find coming from lavish feasts that were taking place around these different longhouses. Many questions remain, however, and as we go on through the project, we're going to be looking at how these different um, results and patterns transfer into the later periods in prehistory. Overall, though, we're seeing a very rich and complex story for inequality in the Neolithic, one that can't be reduced to a simple narrative. And I guess I wanted to leave you um, with a final thought, that if the Neolithic can find ways to share out and distribute um, food in different ways, why can't we do that in the present? Um, and just to acknowledge uh, the support that we've had for the project, particularly our funder, the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Thank you very much. Thank you.